Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this room in all its senses, Father, for the facility, for the comfort, for the people, for the opportunity to meet, for the word that is in our lap and as we turn our mind to it, Father, in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for the spirit, the one you sent to teach us all the things that we need to know. And Father, we acknowledge here tonight that he is our teacher. That the words I may speak, Father, if they have merit, they come because they come that way because they, they are your words. And uh, when they're mine, Father, then we know they're they're of no value. And we ask, Father, that those who are here would see the blessing that comes from sitting at your feet. And they would be reminded that though our world would cause us to, to think of many other things and to be doing many other things, there's so many good reasons we need to be Mary and not Martha, Father. And I thank you that we've had that put on our heart tonight. Let this study go as you will, declaring your word as you intend and always to your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So open your Bibles with me, please, to John chapter 1. Leon Morris wrote that, John's gospel is a pool in which both a child can wade and an elephant can swim. It's a book of simple and yet very profound truth, relying on metaphor and symbols to reveal Christ to be the only begotten Son of God. And most Christians have at least read parts, if not all of it, and in the case of one particular verse, probably know something of it by heart. Chronologically, the Gospel of John was the next to last book of Scripture penned at the very end of the first century, only the book of Revelation comes later in our understanding. And yet it's often the first book we recommend to that person who has some curiosity about Christ or about Christianity. John's gospel is so memorable, I think, partly because of its uniqueness among the gospels. We know that it's very different from the other three, but also because of John's distinct purpose in writing it. By the time John's gospel was written, the church had come to understand and recognize that God's timetable for the return of the Lord to the earth was going to be a lot longer than they had first anticipated. All but one of the apostles had died by this point, and it was now second and third generation Christians who were running the church. John, you may know, is Jewish, but he wrote for this increasingly Gentile church. So we're going to see throughout the gospel, he takes a lot of time to explain Jewish words and customs and concepts and geography. And the church, having been embraced by Gentiles and its Jewish constituencies, quickly dwindling at this point, the church had changed a lot in its first 70 years or so. And as a result, men had come to understand that the promise of a coming kingdom was to be understood with some new appreciation and some degree of patience relative to what they had expected when they first received the church from Christ. Certainly it remains a true, physical, literal kingdom that we await. A promise that Jesus will return and rule from Jerusalem. That is still the promise we expect. But by the time John wrote this gospel, few expected the arrival of that kingdom was going to happen right around the corner. They had begun to understand it was going to take a long time. After all, if the earth had waited thousands of years for God to reveal his son the first time, it stands to reason it may take several thousand years before he comes back. And therefore, unlike the other gospels, John approached his with the purpose of strengthening the church for that long period, potential period, in which the church would exist on earth with the spirit, certainly, but yet still waiting for the Lord's return. And in recognition that the second coming is not going to be so soon, he emphasizes the present day reality of living in the light of Christ's kingdom with this understanding of Christ's ever present authority in the lives of believers. This is why the gospel resonates so much even for us today. It's showing believers to abide in Christ, to depend on his word, to trust in his power, to understand he is the shepherd and still at work shepherding the sheep, even though we cannot see him right now. So because of that unique focus on living in the light of the truth of the gospel of Christ, and because it came last, I guess, John chose to skip over Many of those important moments that we know from the other Gospels. In fact, the list is quite stunning. John omits Jesus's genealogy, his birth, his baptism by John, his temptation in the desert, any exercising of demons, no parables whatsoever. The transfiguration is missing. The Lord's Supper is not described in John's Gospel. His agony in Gethsemane is overlooked, as is his ascension. And in place of all of those things, 
He reveals Christ through these extended discourses, which have become so famous. He's known for this, where you see Jesus interacting with a variety of actors, a Pharisee, a woman of ill repute, a blind man, a lame man, a crowd seeking to be fed, his earthly brothers, and of course, his various disciples. All of those conversations are comical ships passing in the night kinds of moments in which Jesus speaks in all these deep spiritual terms, using metaphors, birth, water, bread, blindness, and so on. And his audience usually remains completely oblivious to everything because they're bound by some earthly perspective, thinking of these metaphors in literal terms. And as a result, John employs the verb pisteo, in Greek literally the word belief, 98 times. Belief, belief, belief. But he never uses the noun form of that word, pistis, which is faith. In other words, it's not the mechanism by which we become believers that is at the center of his gospel. It's the necessity of knowing Christ through an active, continual trust in the Lord that forms the structure of his gospel. He's not simply concerned with the moment of our confession. He's concerned with everything that comes after that as a disciple of Christ. The content of John's gospel, the stuff he did select, it suggests almost a a portfolio of Jesus's best moments, if you could say it that way. They're selected to illustrate both his deity and his humanity. To demonstrate his deity, John relies on seven and only seven of Jesus' miracles. Each of these miracles are captured in a chapter, and then after each, you'll find this lengthy discourse, which we're going to look at. And in that discourse, Jesus himself takes up in a first-person narrative a discussion of what was the significance of the miracle he just performed. And through those moments, we're all going to see him as a Lord who is compassionate, a shepherd who cares for his people, and the like the one who has the power to sustain them in the present age. But then to remind us of his humanity, and John's gospel is particularly unique in its approach to Jesus' humanity, he selects other moments when we can see Jesus reacting to circumstances almost exactly the way we would have had we been there. Submitting to his own mother's authority, for example. Weeping at the death of a friend. Raging at corrupt and evil men in the temple. Expressing disappointment at his disciples' poor choices at times. And finally, it's known for his seven statements of I am. Jesus saying, I am. Jesus says, I am the bread. I am the light. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the life and the resurrection. I am the vine. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That phrase, I am, doesn't it invoke the name of God provided to Moses through the burning bush? Reminding us that while God has revealed himself in many portions and in many ways through Moses and the other prophets in these last days, he has spoken through his son. I am. As Thomas Constable said, the knowledge of who Jesus really is, is the key to the knowledge of who God really is. And so John wrote his gospel to reveal Jesus as the light who came into the world to conquer darkness, the provider, the life giver, the good shepherd, the one who receives all that the father sends and loses not a one. And so even as we start now in John chapter one, verse one, even at the start of his gospel, it's wholly unique, of course, and reflective of his purpose. John begins by affirming Jesus's role, even at the very beginning in all creation. John one beginning in verse one, he says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. I think it's safe to say it doesn't take a seminary professor to notice that the opening words of John's account are familiar. In fact, if you were to recite the words in the beginning to a Bible student, and ask them to complete the sentence, you'd be equally likely to hear them finish with either Genesis 1-1 or John 1-1. The first five verses of Genesis and John are so strikingly similar, and of course, that's no accident. In fact, let me begin with the first five verses of Genesis 1 just to show you the comparison. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. So just like Genesis, John begins with this statement of a beginning of creation and also mentions of light and darkness, just as was in the first day of creation. John is borrowing from the words of Genesis intentionally so that we would ponder that connection and ponder, of course, we will for this is verse-by-verse ministry. So 
Who is this God who created all things? The God with the power to create merely by speaking creation into existence. A God who made light by his word and then separated light from darkness with that same word. Well, John is writing in chapter one to answer that question for us. That God, that creator was no less than Jesus Christ himself. The member of the Godhead who acted to bring about the creation was not the father, but was the son. And since he spoke the creation into existence, as we see in Genesis one, that's why John goes to calling Jesus the word. It is so that we would be sure to understand that Christ is the one and only creator. As John says in verse three, he is the word in the sense that it was by his word that the creation came into being. Paul echoes this truth, by the way, in Colossians, remembering, interestingly, that Colossians was written decades before John's gospel. Paul says this, Colossians 1.15, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So John coined the name, the word, as a succinct way to explain that in the creation story of Genesis 1, you're seeing the work of Jesus, not the father, although, of course, they work in unison. But then John also points out that there is God apart from the word and they are distinct. And yet they were together in the beginning. And so by definition, if two entities are both present before the start of a creative process, then by definition, neither created the other. For they both predate the creation, so therefore both are God. Perhaps John is trying to clarify Genesis 1:26, where God declares, let us make man in our image. It's interesting, that reference to God in the original Hebrew, Elohim, written in 126 of Genesis, it's in the plural. And it's interesting because that's something that the Jewish nation remained perplexed about for millennia. For in their mind, God was a singular entity and had no plural nature. There was nothing about him that could be plural. And yet in their own word, there was this plural reference. It is also interesting to show you their scrupulous nature. They were willing to copy what they were given without question, though their own minds couldn't agree with it. Proof that the word has been carried very carefully through history by the Jewish scribes. Now we see from John's gospel that the plural tense was intended in Genesis 126 to reflect the Trinity of the Godhead. And ironically, John is embarking here on explaining how God made his son in the image of man, so to speak, while referencing how man was made in the image of God. We could talk all night on the mystery of the Trinity, but honestly, even after hours of talking, we probably wouldn't understand it any better than we do right now. So simply put, our God is one God in three persons. Continuing with the creation story, John gives Christ yet another name. He'll do this a lot in his gospel. He gives him a lot of names. He calls him light. Specifically, he says Jesus is life and the light of the world. John's establishing a chain of logic here as he moves through his opening. It's a prologue, some call it. Logically, he's saying if Jesus is the creator and God, then he is also the source of all life by definition, since God is the life giver. And so Christ being the creator, he is the life of men. But. Christ gives men life in two ways. There's the physical, but he's also the source of eternal life, spiritual life. And that's what John means when he says he is the light of the world, the light of men. Once again, he's borrowing from the first day of creation. Christ created light and darkness on that first day of creation. That design, by the way, is very different from the one that God will use in creating the new heavens and new earth, which we will all occupy one day in the future. In that new world, we're told in Revelation chapter 22, verse 5, there will be only light. There will be no darkness in that future world, which begs a big question. If the new perfect world has no darkness, why did God include darkness in his plan for the current world? Was he simply having a down day and he made a mistake and looking ahead, he says, I know a better way now? Well, no, of course not. And John is giving us the answer here for why that change happens. He's alluding to the answer when he draws our attention between light and spiritual life by making that connection, by explaining that light can be a metaphor for spiritual life, for eternal life. God uses light as a metaphor in scripture for a number of related ideas of truth and for righteousness. Light is righteousness. Light is eternal life, which comes from righteousness, which we receive in Christ. 
And dark has exactly the opposite meaning in Scripture. It's often used as a picture of sin, the darkness of a man's heart, or of death, of the place of foreboding and of the abyss. So we gain now an understanding that in our present world, we are experiencing light and darkness in the design of creation so that God has at his ready metaphors for the sin of this world and the righteousness that comes through Christ so that he can draw on these metaphors as he seeks to teach men about the need to go from darkness to light of Christ's impact to the sinful world when he arrived of being a light into the darkness. In other words, these metaphors of the creation were embedded for our benefit. And once we reach the new heavens and new earth, where there is no longer any sin or death, there will be no need for the metaphors that were used to explain it. So we will no longer have any darkness, we're told. And going beyond that, we will no longer have any sea, for sea is a metaphor for hell. And we will no longer have any sun, moon, or stars, for God says in creation that those were given to us as signs and omens for things that we no longer have to be warned about. And therefore... John is saying Jesus is the solution to the problem of darkness. He is the light into a dark world. Therefore, he is the eternal life in contrast to the sin of the world. The question then becomes, and John picks this theme up at this point, what will become of the darkness once the light arrives? Will the darkness embrace the light of Christ? John answers it in verse 5. I guess he wasn't much for suspense. Jesus brought his light into the world, but it was not understood by the darkness. John neatly summarizes Jesus' entire earthly ministry in that one verse. Jesus revealing himself to the world, but the world rejecting him. I want you to note the first half of that verse is written in the present tense, while the second half is in the past tense. The revelation of God in Christ is forever available, and therefore it shines without end. The revelation was not limited to simply to a period of time in which Jesus walked on the earth during his first coming. It is an everlasting revelation. From henceforth, the world now understands who the Messiah is. And the light of who he is remains visible, both through the spirit living in the church, but also, of course, through the word of God primarily. The second half of that verse is past tense because it refers to the way the nation of Israel rejected Jesus at his first coming. They rejected their own Messiah. So the unbelieving hearts of men in that day did not comprehend the message of the gospel in Christ. And that's another major theme in John's gospel. As we go through the rest, you'll see explaining the rejection of Christ. And now in verses 6 through 8, John begins to explain the completeness of that rejection. He says in verse 6, There came a man sent from God, his name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. It might be easy to dismiss the Jews' rejection of Christ as merely misunderstanding or perhaps a case of mistaken identity or whatever else was happening. But John wants you all to know and to make clear that the rejection was spiritual and supernatural. And he begins with this simple observation on the ministry of John the Baptist. John, we know from Scripture, was sent by God, which means he was a prophet. And in fact, we often say John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets. And in that sense... His ministry was to call the world to understand of the Messiah's impending arrival. He's a man who was to come proclaiming that hearts need to be ready for what was about to happen in the world. That is Christ's arrival. Notice John says, John, the, the gospel writer says, John the Baptist was a witness sent to testify concerning the light. John's ministry was essentially to prepare an audience so that as Jesus entered into public ministry, there was a ready audience waiting for him. John essentially prepped the audience for Jesus' arrival. And not merely to expect him someday or in the future, but to expect him imminently. To be literally looking up as if he were going to come across the road right in that moment. As Isaiah said, he was preparing a way for Christ by stirring up interest within Israel. And those who believed in the promised Messiah would then have followed John into the desert and submitted to the baptism of water as a sign of their repentance and readiness in anticipation. And then when Jesus finally appeared, John had prepared those disciples as an audience to follow Jesus from that point forward in his public ministry. So as Jesus came to John for his own baptism, which we know John's gospel does not cover, John was announcing and Jesus was affirming to John's disciples that he was the Messiah just as foretold. And at that moment, John directed his disciples to begin following the Lord in his own place. Notice in verse 8, John clarifies that John the Baptist was not the Messiah, but he was rather the prophet who was called to announce the coming of the Messiah. Now, John has more to say about John the Baptist here in a minute. But for now, he just returns to this theme of Jesus as God and creator, 
as he paints a contrast now between Jesus and John the Baptist. He'll do this now for the rest of the prologue. Verses 9 through 13. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him to him, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, as we're going to understand what John is teaching here, we need to keep in mind that John wrote knowing that the other Gospels were available to his readers. And in those Gospels, John the Baptist has already been well chronicled. And so, of course, John knew his audience had some understanding of who John the Baptist was. That's not the problem. In other words, the problem isn't knowing who John the Baptist was. The concern at this point in the end of the first century was knowing who he was not. There was this lingering question of John's role and more of his importance. In Jesus' day, men were questioning John's identity, which we'll look at here in a minute. But even in John's day, late in the first century, there were still people who had an unhealthy interest in John the Baptist. In fact, even now today, there is still a sect, which is hostile to Christianity, by the way, living in present day Iraq, that claims to be the ancestral followers of John the Baptist. So John is taking a lot of effort at this point in the gospel to distinguish John's importance from Christ's importance, why John the Baptist was not the light. In fact, he says that, right? There is a true light that enters the world. It wasn't John. That light came to his own, that being the Jewish people, of course. And the very people John the Baptist had been attempting to prepare, the Jewish people, are the very same people who in the end rejected Christ when he finally arrived. The Jewish rejection of Christ is all the more astounding when we consider John's opening theme here. That of creation. Jesus is the source of spiritual truth for all men. He is the one who made the world. And then, in the mystery of the incarnation, he became a part of the very world that he himself made. Nevertheless, the creator, the one who condescended to come into his own creation, is then rejected by that same creation. Consider the humility of a God who would orchestrate circumstances by which he would suffer humiliation at the hands of the very people he spoke into existence and granted life. The word world, cosmos in Greek, that John will use quite often in his gospel, it's commonly used in a negative sense. Not always, but in this case it is. Like at the end of verse 10, you see this emphasis where he says the word world as a euphemism for the unbeliever. The unbelieving world, in other words. That world is living in the darkness of their sinful nature and in a fallen state. And as a result, their dark, hard hearts leave them incapable of understanding truth. That is, of seeing light in the metaphor John's using. So I want you to imagine a a simple scene of of a blind man standing outside and bright sunbeams are cascading down on his face. Despite the brightness of the light, that person will remain in darkness for as long as they are blind. Someone has to give them eyes to see before the light is detectable. And in the spiritual sense, it's a very similar parallel. The heart has to be open to the truth of the gospel, for no matter how brightly or loudly it's proclaimed, they're not going to detect its truth. Paul taught something very similar in an earlier day in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 3 and 4. He says, and even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. It's almost like John and Paul got together and talked about how they were going to write this up because they're using such similar language. This is another theme John's going to use throughout his gospel repeatedly. The fact that men are, by their nature, set against Christ because of spiritual blindness, and only those the Lord draws to Christ will see the light and come to know the truth. All was not lost in God's plan because some received him. All that received him were granted the right to become adopted children of God. Those who believe in his name, in other words, are those who receive him. And this is the first, mark that verse if you care to, verse 12. That is the first expression of the gospel in John's account. The first time we see what the definition of saving looks like. That is to believe in the name of Christ brings eternal life. How did those few who did believe, who did receive him, how did they find the eyes to see the light? How did they come to that awareness, given so many others did not? Well, in verse 13, John answers that question. 
But in the process, he introduces a yet another of his themes. John says they were born. Now, you and I hear that word, and we hear it in light of modern Christian vocabulary. They were born. We pass right over it without any concerns whatsoever. But we have that vocabulary because of John's gospel. He's the one who coins the born again phrase that we're now so familiar with. John is saying they were born again, to clarify later, and that new birth that gave them eyes to see was not of blood, which means it's not a natural birth, didn't come because of their ancestry. They weren't capable of knowing who Christ was because their father was Abraham, for example, or because they were born in a Jewish family. Nor does he say, was it because of the will of the flesh, meaning it doesn't come because of something we earned by our flesh doing the right thing in the right way, causing God to then find pleasure in us and therefore allowing us something we wouldn't have had. It's not by works. And then lastly, nor does it come by the will of man, meaning we didn't make a choice of our own will to open our eyes and see the light. No more than the blind man can, by his will, decide to suddenly perceive photons of light can the spiritually dead, by their will, decide to perceive spiritual truth. John says our new birth comes exclusively by the will of God, that being the one who grants to us the knowledge of God. Finally, John ends his prologue introducing the final theme of his gospel, that is the fullness of the Father dwelling in the Son, verses 14 through 18. He says, And the Word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who has come after me has a higher rank than I, for he has existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained it. The incarnation, it's another major theme in John's gospel. Jesus didn't just become a man, nor did he merely take on the body of a man. John's words here are very, very specific and purposeful. He says he became flesh. Because if you say it any other way, you leave room for someone to claim that God merely came down looking like a man or came upon some existing man. And that was some of the heresy that was floating around in the church in John's day. No, he truly became flesh. The thought that the eternal creator God could occupy a living body is a concept that has captivated human consciousness ever since God promised it would happen. Even the unbelieving world is fascinated by the idea of God incarnate, although they obviously distort it in ignorance. For example, the Greeks and the Romans had mythology, which was God's coming down as men. Uh, Hollywood has countless messianic deliverers. Every year there's a new movie out with some messianic character. Comic book writers, even sports teams, love to borrow from the incarnation to create demigods that become marketing material or stories. But only once did the true living God take on flesh and dwell among men in the form of Jesus Christ. The word for dwell in Greek is similar to the word in Greek for tabernacle. They're very similar, reminding us that God once dwelled among men in the past, among the Israelites in the desert. But that tabernacling was incomplete and it was temporary. But when Christ took on flesh, he dwelled in a fullness never before seen. A man or a woman can look upon Christ in his day, see him in the face, see his life, hear his words and the like. But John says no one's ever seen the Father. He is spirit. He's not visible within his creation. And therefore, the Son has explained the Father, not only in words, but in his physical incarnation, in the life example that he lived. In fact, the word explained in Greek comes from the same root word from which we get exegesis, which is a word that means to interpret Scripture. That's the process of explaining Scripture. So we can say Jesus interpreted the Father for us, explaining it, showing it to us. John mentions law here, and he mentions Moses. Under the law, virtually no one ever witnessed the glory of God. It existed in one place only, the Holy of Holies, and only one man per year ever walked in there, and even then it was covered in the smoke of incense, so it was barely visible even to him. And under those circumstances, how much did anyone truly know of the Father? Apart from what he revealed through what he gave to the patriarchs and to the prophets, glimpses here and there and in the law. Hebrews summarizes it best. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. He says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the world. Notice again that writer using both the fact that he spoke for the father and the fact that he is the creator and unified the two. 
That's the point John's raising when he says uh, that in the past we had the law and we had Moses. In other words, there was a degree of revelation, a degree of light and truth available in past generations. And that minimal dwelling experience was there under a lesser covenant and a lesser deliverer. But now all the greater things have arrived in the fulfillment of God's promises. The law has given way to grace and truth. Just as John will record Jesus saying later that men must now worship him in light of that grace and that truth. Men will worship now in truth and spirit as opposed to in other ways. This again is John's point. Now, when he refers to John the Baptist again here now, he reminds us John the Baptist was playing the part of yet another of those Old Testament prophets testifying to Christ, but in a limited way, with a limited understanding. He was, in fact, the final man to get one of those portions, one of those partial revelations. And his purpose in his portion was to reveal who the Messiah would be. Past prophets had revealed the need for one or the work of the one or the death of the one. He was to reveal who it would be. And that revelation told men that the fullness of God was now to be found in this particular man. John's role was not to compete with Jesus, not to compliment Jesus. In fact, he himself says Jesus existed before I did, which, if you remember the genealogies out of Luke's gospel, is an interesting comment. For John the Baptist was born six months prior to Jesus from Elizabeth. And yet John the Baptist knew who Christ was truly and therefore was able to say, it matters not when I was physically born, this Man existed before all. Jesus was the complete and final expression of God the Father to his creation. He is the begotten God, later to be called the begotten Son by John. And that is also one of John's unique descriptions of Christ. Begotten, monogenes in Greek, it means literally the only one to come forth. It does not suggest a literal birth or a creation process. It rather speaks to the unique manifestation that has been sent out from God the Father. But before he was sent out, it says Christ was in the Father's bosom, which is a very unique Jewish idiom. It describes a very intimate and close relationship which existed. Such was the Father and the Son. In fact, it's interesting, later in the Gospel, John describes himself as the one whom Jesus loved and describes himself as reclining into the bosom of Jesus. I guess when you're the author, you can paint the picture however you choose, not to dispute it. But anyway, John has opened the Gospel now in this way. He's presented Christ as the Creator, the eternal and one God living with the Father from the beginning, the light, the truth, the fullness of God, and yet flesh living among men. Those are the themes that are going to reverberate throughout the 21 chapters in John's Gospel. And he finishes his prologue now by introducing Jesus' public ministry, which is what we'll do to finish our night here as well. And he does it interestingly by explaining the end of John's formal ministry. In other words, it is the case that the handoff took place. That John's end was Jesus' beginning, and they met in the moment when those two things happened at his baptism. Verses 19 through 28. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, well, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? And he said, no. Well, they say to him, well, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. And they asked him and they said to him, why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. So this encounter is the first of the narratives and the discourses of John's gospel, and it, it actually begins what will appear to be, as we look at it over the next week or so, it appears to be the first of a single week of some very important events in the opening of John's gospel. In fact, all the way through chapter 2 in the wedding in Cana, all the events between the wedding and what we're seeing happen here happen in the span of seven days. And as we look at the gospel, you'll see, as John says, the next day, the next day, the next day. And he's going to describe seven days of things that show you just how quickly and how momentously Jesus's earthly ministry gets started following the baptism, which he doesn't record. It's a week for the changing of the guard. In other words, John, the Baptist is leaving the scene. Jesus is entering the scene. John's disciples are leaving him to join Jesus. And Jesus himself is on the brink of revealing himself in public ministry 
through miracles and through teaching authority, though he doesn't want to be pushed into it any sooner than he has to, his mother's interest notwithstanding. And so as we get to the end of that week, we see just where we stand in the beginning of his ministry. Going back to this moment, John begins by relating how the end of John the Baptist's ministry comes about when he's confronted by men who are sent from Pharisees. And these men are sent to question him over his authority and his identity. And then, as you see, John answers each question without hesitation. He first denies he's the Christ, but then he denies also he's Elijah. And then there's this question of the prophet. Now, each of these questions has its roots in Jewish understanding of Old Testament prophecy. The Old Testament told Israel to expect a conquering, reigning Messiah to arrive for their sake one day, a a conquering Messiah who would put an end to foreign rule, who would lift Israel up to be the chief nation on the earth, and would finally and forevermore put Israel at peace over all her enemies. And who wouldn't want that in the nation of Israel, certainly? That was the man called the Christ. He would rule with a rod of iron, they knew. But it also told Israel that there would rise a great prophet one day in their nation. And this great prophet would come speaking the words of God and of healing and of the need for Israel to return to their fathers, etc. And that this prophet would end up suffering a great death on behalf of the sins of Israel, the Lamb of God. And then in addition to those two, there was Malachi who said that the prophet Elijah would return before a great and terrible day of the Lord to come upon Israel and the Pharisees who were the religious authorities in Israel of this day, they had come to understand all of what they read in the Old Testament to teach that there would be a Christ and that there would be a prophet and that there would be Elijah. And these were three different people. They had no understanding of how, for example, a conquering king could also be a suffering prophet. They couldn't reconcile the two. So they concluded that there were two messiahs. But of course, we know there aren't two messiahs. There's just two comings of the same messiah. The first coming comes in that form of the prophet who suffers and dies for the sake of Israel's sins and the sins of the world. And then we have the Christ who will return and rule in a future day. And before each of those arrivals, there is a forerunner who comes to announce their corresponding visit of the Messiah. Before the second coming, for example, the Bible says Elijah will return to prepare Israel for their Lord's return. Malachi is the one who teaches us that. And of course, as we sit here today, that is yet to happen. Obviously, the second coming has not happened and neither has Elijah return. But before the Messiah's first coming, there was also to be a forerunner, a different forerunner, John the Baptist. And Isaiah said that this forerunner would come to make paths straight in the wilderness before the son's arrival. So when the priests and the other Levites come to inquire of John, they guessed three of the four possibilities, but they overlooked the one correct one. John was the prophet Isaiah said would come before the Messiah. So John quotes from Isaiah 40 to explain his identity. And the Pharisees would have undoubtedly recognized that quote. They knew the Old Testament by heart for the most part. So they would have understood what John was saying about himself. He was claiming to be the fulfillment of that prophecy, to be the one who was called upon to announce the arrival of the Messiah. But interestingly, since the Pharisees did not see John the right way, they couldn't see Jesus the right way either. So when they asked John to explain himself, John's answer is not focused on himself. Look what he does. His purpose is to direct their attention to the one who is to come, to the mission he has, that is to announce Christ find that to be an interesting side point for anyone who wants to be in public ministry, even as an individual on the street, that as your question for who you are, your power, your authority, your rights to do what you do, it's simply the opportunity to declare the power and the authority of Christ once again. And if you're not going to receive your word, they're not going to receive his word either. In other words, you are there on Christ's behalf to represent him. He says Jesus brings a baptism far greater than the one that he was performing. John was doing water. Baptism, which has no spiritual significance in John's day, except that it was a public confession of repentance in anticipation of a Messiah to come soon. It was a way of saying, I believe in the promise and I believe it's coming. But water, having no spiritual purpose, had to give way to something that did. And the earthly substance of water is replaced by a spiritual baptism that God alone provides through his son. When we believe, we receive the Holy Spirit. That's the baptism Jesus brought to those who believe In his name. And John says, I come as a forerunner to prepare hearts for that coming Lord. And he boldly says to these guys, this is what got him into trouble later, as you know. He says, you don't know the Messiah. This guy that you're here to talk about, you don't even know who he is. That's why you can't see him. Because they're not willing to submit to the baptism of John. They were demonstrating their hearts were not prepared for the Messiah. In other words, the crooked roads 
that John was called to prepare wasn't literal roads. It was a metaphor for crooked, sinful hearts. He was called to get hearts ready for the Messiah. And as John declared his call for repentance in preparation for Jesus' arrival, some men responded and many others did not. A person who challenged John's authority or refused to submit to his baptism was revealing a heart that was not prepared, that remained crooked. And they were not going to follow the Messiah when he appeared. And surely the Pharisees and the Levites and the priests, by and large, did not. So he rightly says, you didn't know the Messiah. And yet that Messiah was so great, John was not even worthy to untie his sandals. As we begin our study and end our night, I'm hoping that everyone in here is aware of Jesus in this way, in the way John is declaring that he must be known in the deity of God and in the authority of Lord. And that I would also hope your hearts have been prepared as you came in or as you've heard the lesson tonight to see his light and to hear his truth. Have we humbled ourselves and sought the salvation that only comes through Christ? If not, you're in the right place. And in weeks to come, if you haven't already seen the truth of who Christ is, you'll see it. But for the most part, I'm assuming we do know him for who he is. And if so, then look at this study as an opportunity to be reaffirmed in your abiding trust in Christ. That while we await, he is not less present, he is not less powerful, he is not less authoritative, he is not less compassionate or concerned. His physical presence gives way to a spiritual presence in our life, but that spiritual presence is every bit as powerful. One day we'll see him face to face. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you, Lord, for... um, an opening that will lead to many great things in your word. And I ask, Father, that for the good start we've had, it would just be that, a start, that for those hearts who have been brought here tonight, that you would uh, give them cause to continue, to concern themselves with what may lay ahead, that you are not a God of chance or of circumstance, that there is a purpose in everything that happens. And so I ask, Father, that you convict us for why you brought us and convince us, Father, that it's part of something you intended and that we would have courage to hold steadfast to it until we can gain the fullness of all that you have planned here in your word. And that uh, what we've not learned, what we've begun to learn, would help us, Father, grow in the light of what we know and to be more like you, but also to serve you in stronger and better ways. And I uh, thank you, Father, that we could, we could have this time in your word. Let it come to its appointed end according to your purpose. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.